as you can probably hear, but uh, I'll try. It's not, it's not too obvious. No. Robot. Okay. First if we all, have to interrupt, yeah, we'll uh, yeah. Do you like being called Ed Bear or Edward Bear? Edward. Edward Bear. Yes. First of all, what were you doing in India in the, in the 40s? In the during the Second World War, I'm sorry. Let me take this again. Mm. Uh, during the Second World War. Uh, there was a pressing need for junior leaders in the much expanded Indian Army, and there was a very attractive scheme to public school bo public school uh, inmates. Uh, I was one of them to be recruited into the Indian Army practically direct. If you passed the selection board and did basic training, which was quite tough, in the Queen's Royal Regiment in Maidstone and made it, they took you out to India in a troop ship, sent you to officer cadet training school, OCTS, I went to Bangalore, and uh, commissioned you in the Indian Army. And this is what happened to me. I, I uh, signed up for this uh, when I was 17. And this was just after the Second World War? No, this was during, this was 1944. And you spent three years? I spent uh, quite a lot of time, yes, because one of the things that I realized only afterwards was that the contract one signed uh, kept you in India as long as they wanted you. So whereas people uh, were uh, demobilized long before me, uh, who joined the army at the same time, I was kept on because I was doing things in India which they regarded as, as worthwhile. I must say I don't regret this in the slightest. Uh, I was uh, with a prestigious uh, Indian Army regiment called the Royal Garwa Rifle. Uh, was sent to posted to their first battalion. We uh, were fighting a rather nasty little colonial war in Indonesia, which was then a Dutch colony, immediately after the war, having disarmed the Japanese. And then uh, my battalion was moved to Peshawar which is, of course, now in Pakistan. And I was appointed acting brigade major, and I remained there throughout partition and the awful massacres that followed, and I was only demobilized in, I think, January 1948. Did the Gawal rifles in Peshawar have any role in maintaining law and order in the northwest frontier during the run-up to partition? No. Uh, what happened was this. The, I mean, this, a lot of people have written about the mess uh, that surrounded partition, and it was an awful mess. Uh, to this day, I think that Mountbatten jumped in far too early, and I happen to know that on both Indian and Pakistani sides, they begged him to give them another three months to sort things out, and he wouldn't, uh, partly because it was a question of vanity. He wanted, I think, the 15th of August to stand out as a sort of landmark in his own life because it was also the anniversary of his taking the Japanese surrender two years earlier. Um, so when, for instance, I mean, mine was a sort of uh, fly-on-the-wall uh, junior vision of all this, but when, for instance, uh, the independence occurred on the 15th of August, the five battalion uh, strong uh, Peshawar Frontier Brigade group was down to two effective battalions. The Gawalis had gone. Uh, the Black Watch was there, but the Black Watch was confined to barracks. The a new arrival was a Punjab regiment, now Pakistani, that had come from Delhi and moved into the Peshawar cantonment, and that was about it. And uh, the horrible thing was that uh, the Punjab regiment that had arrived in Peshawar just before partition had seen the massacres of their own people by Sikhs, and they were in no mood to uh, turn against their fellow countrymen. And the massacre of Sikhs that occurred in Peshawar was horrendous, something like 800 a day for about 10 days. And there was very little we could do to stop it until we used very direct and horrible methods like blowing up cars with tanks uh, that were looting the Sikh properties and killing Sikhs at random. You were witness to that violence against I, uh, I was uh, implementing it as Brigade Major. I got the 
uh, a squadron of tanks out on the streets and with my brigade commander's authorization, I ordered them to open fire. And you were opening fire on... We were opening fire on Patans, all of them armed, who had moved into Peshawar, who were driving around in stolen cars, who were knew what they were doing. Uh, they attacked, burnt, uh, plundered, and killed Sikh residents in as many as they could. They also, for instance, these same Patans surrounded a Sikh uh, stronghold in old Prashar city and set fire to it, and we had to blow up part of the building in order to stop the fire, having evacuated the people first, of course. But it was, it was a war. You say that they knew what they were doing. Were they <coughs> motivated by simply the desire for wealth, or were they politically motivated? It was a, it was a mixture. The, we thought uh, at first that the kind of massacres that were going on in Calcutta, in Delhi, all over the place, in the Punjab, might not happen in Peshawar, and that Peshawar might be spared. And then an awful thing happened on the 7th of September, uh, the Punjab regiment opened fire on the a Sikh unit next door, which was confined to barracks. And this uh, uh, led to one death of a Sikh soldier. And the rumor spread immediately throughout the town, but also beyond the town, to the villages in outlying areas, that the Sikhs had attacked the new Pakistan army. And they moved in and started killing Sikhs. And we were unprepared for this. We didn't have the troops. We didn't have the, the means to do anything about it uh, for about one or two days. And to prevent a huge massacre of Sikhs, we had to take drastic measures. Uh, I got the police chief to agree to uh, the army which was now the Pakistan army, the reliable units that we could use, and there were only a few hundred of them, to move the Sikhs into the old fort in Peshawar. And we kept them there under horrible conditions, because there again, there were thousands of them, tens of thousands, and the sanitation conditions were appalling. And then the problem arose, what do we do with these Sikhs, who have to go back, obviously, to India, and who are threatened with uh, death on the way back. And my brigade commander, who was a very uh, dashing, tough Gurkha, ex-Gurkha officer, who'd also been a Chindit, his name was Brigadier Morris, uh, we worked out a scheme whereby uh, a convoy would go down the road from Peshawar in the direction of Royal Pindi. And this convoy would look like an ordinary convoy of Sikh refugees, but I called also for Sikh soldiers uh, in these groups to uh, remain concealed in their, uh, in their trucks. But if there was an ambush, they were to respond. And this happened. The uh, Patans opened fire on the trucks as they drove down the Prashar Naushira road, the Sikhs fired back. I was with them. And the Patans were <laughs> very, very surprised to have this kind of response, and they ran away. And we managed to get all the people down the road to Naushira and then back to Rawalpindi in that fashion. You were a brigade major, but technically part of the Pakistan. Well, it was very curious. I was wearing the uniform of an officer of the Gawa Rifles, which was an Indian Army regiment, which is assimilated to the to the Gurkhas and wears kukris and so on. Uh, and yet, yes, I was under a this very new command and the Prashar Brigade was indeed part of the new Pakistan army but uh, confusion was such that really these we, we didn't think about who we were uh, responsible to the, the fact is that for instance in my own regiment the Gawar Rifles there had been some Muslim Indian officers uh, one of them uh, a major decided to stay with the Indian Army in India. Uh, the other one, with a, 
sort of family history of uh, service in the Indian Army that went back three or four generations, decided to join the Pakistan Army. So you had these strange, uh, and this, uh, the officer who joined the Pakistan Army, in fact, found himself a few weeks later fighting his former comrades in Kashmir in a real uh, standard battle. In fact, this so upset him that he resigned his commission and moved to America. Independence Day, just before these problems, I and mean, do you remember August the 14th in Peshawar, Pakistan's Independence Day? Yes, indeed. I mean, we were, uh, we planned a rather moving ceremony with the, uh, the Black Watch pipe band, uh, the British flag coming down and the Pakistani flag going up, and it was indeed quite a uh, quite a moment. And was it well received? What was the mood of the local people? The mood of the local people was bafflement uh, and also one has to say uh, not entirely uh, unalloyed joy because there happened to be in Peshawar uh, someone called Abdul Ghaffar Khan known as the Frontier Gandhi who was very in touch with Congress and who and was also very left-wing, and he had a lot of troops. I mean, he had a lot of sympathizers and, and uh, uh, people who were organized in fairly paramilitary structures. And these people did not at all want to join Pakistan. They wanted to be a, a sort of Congress enclave in that part of the world. And uh, quite obviously, these people uh, were not disposed to be terribly favorable to uh, to Pakistan and indeed the Pathans uh, in that part of the world were at that time very much in favor of, of remaining apart anyway as they'd always been with the sort of tribal authority and the kind of system that uh, the, the British had encouraged with political agents uh, uh, using their power, which was considerable, in a very uh, soft way, always handling things through tribal chieftains and so on. And suddenly, here was uh, a Pakistan, and the Pathans were not really geared for that. So the Pathans were reluctant Pakistanis? I would say that some of them definitely were reluctant Pakistanis, yes. And in terms of the impact on the military, you were the head of a basically a mainly Hindu regiment which was serving in a mainly Muslim part of, of the Raj. No, I wasn't. I was, I was acting brigade major, and I was very young. I was totally unqualified for this. I moved into this position because there's no one else. Uh, I was wearing a captain's, captain's rank, uh, and I wasn't leading anything. I was, uh, I was a brigade major uh, passing on orders to battalions and liaising with them and acting as a sort of buffer between the brigade commander and the troops. But yes, we, uh, the, the Gawalis was an all-Hindu battalion, but the Gawalis moved out a few days before August 14. Uh, so what you had was a mixture of uh, Pakistani units coming in from India, uh, officers being posted from God knows where to Peshawar, uh, from Indian Army units in India, uh, people who had chosen Pakistan and so on. But it took a long time for this to settle. But the, the old India hands among the Englishmen in the Indian Army must have been devastated to find that a regimental system that they built up over generations was suddenly cloven in two. Well, the, they, they certainly were. Uh, the the lack of preparation, psychological preparation for this, was one of the reasons for drop in morale. Uh, the Indian Army had very strong feelings of loyalties to their own people. There were Kumaunis, the Kumaun Regiment, uh, Sikh, the Sikh Regiment, uh, several Punjab regiments and so on. They were all uh, imbued with a sense of their own past and uh, military glory and so on. And suddenly a number of these regiments were in Pakistan and a number of regiments were in India. And people who had known each other very well and who had been comrades in arms in Burma fighting the Japanese were suddenly two separate countries and indeed when the clash began in Kashmir as it did a couple of weeks later they were fighting each other. 
and the decision to use tanks to quell civil unrest, which is a remarkable decision to take in any event, that was a, a military decision or a political decision? No, that was a military decision. Uh, it's not something that we, uh, we used very much, for instance, uh, but there was a proliferation of cars with armed men who were killing people, including women and children, and nastily cutting off their breasts before killing them and so on, and piling up the loot in these cars. The police were completely powerless before this because the, the, uh, uh, in a clash, the Patans would open fire and, and some policemen were killed. Uh, what was one to do? Uh, the, reluctantly, we decided to make an example of, I would say, four cars which were blown up and left where they were with the bodies, with the loot, with everything, the, the rupee notes, uh, the jewellery. And this was an example because immediately news spread that the tanks had fired on three or four cars all over the city. There were abandoned stolen cars with abandoned loot. People just ran away. I think that although the, the lo there was a loss of life, it was probably, in a sense, despite the brutality of it all, it was probably minimal force. And it saved sea lives. It in saved a lot of lives. Uh, I mean, you've got to remember that uh, I think on the second or third day of that fateful week, um, the, the Patans coming in from outside were doing very horrible things. For instance, they moved into the Peshawar military hospital in the cantonment and started killing Sikh and Indian soldiers who had not been, who had been too sick to be evacuated back to India and were still there. And there were a few Black Watch people in beds in that hospital, and they found themselves showered with gifts from these Patans who went out of their way to show that they were not hostile to British troops in this fashion. Uh, it was a very strange situation. It was, uh, it was a mixture of Alice in Wonderland, Kafka, and, and nastiness. A related, slightly related subject. You mentioned you were fighting with the Garawalis in Indonesia. You were fighting against whom? We were fighting against the Tentera Republica Indonesia, which was a loose confederation of Indonesian nationalists who were very alarmed by the presence of Gurkha, Indian and British troops in Java and Sumatra uh, because they thought that they were going to become immediately independent, instead of which, of course, they saw the presence of the Indian divisions as proof that the place was going to be handed back to the Dutch, which indeed it was. So while the Congress Party here in India was supporting the Indonesian nationalists, the Indian army was fighting them? Uh, yes, they were. Uh, and we uh, we were fighting a a fairly muted war. It was much more terrifying in Java than it was in Sumatra. But in Sumatra, uh, there were there were random killings. Uh, we suddenly realized that the roads were not safe at night, that when uh, they started throwing grenades in positions and we had to d dig in, they started uh, kidnapping Dutch civilians and holding them as hostages and so on, and we had to go out and mount an operation to liberate them. And indeed, a tiny little facet of this brief, completely unwritten story is that uh, we were so short of people in Java and Sumatra that at one time, not for too long because Mountbatten put an end to it, he, he was outraged when he heard about it, we rearmed the Japanese and even brought them in to fight on our side against the Indonesian. And indeed, a book has just appeared, I think, in Japan by a former officer who <laughs> was there and tells the story of the war after the war. So colonial powers are making common cause to defeat nationalist movements? You can put it that way, if you like. I mean, I remember it was not, uh, it was much more uh, prevalent in Java than in Sumatra, but for instance, at, at one point, uh, we lacked a, a medical officer in our battalion, and a Japanese medical officer uh, <laughs> was there and sat in for him for a few weeks. Excellent. Thank you. Have a
that again? Yeah, sure. I mean, all right, okay. When you heard the hospital was attacked, where were you and what did you do? I was at my desk in brigade headquarters, which was only about uh, 800 yards from where the hospital was, and I was down to my last squad of reserves who were Pakistan engineers whom I had never met before and I had no idea of their state of mind. And I just grabbed them and said, we've got to go and see what's happening at the hospital. So we drove around there in, in uh, a couple of trucks. And uh, we were fired on by the Patans who were surrounding the hospital and were dragging civilians out of the uh, hospital and, and butchering them. Uh, I knew my way around the place, and we went up the back way onto the rooftops. And uh, there I was with uh, soldiers, and I had no idea how they were going to respond to any kind of orders. So I asked uh, the Havildar, I ordered the Havildar to give me his Bren gun, and I started f firing at the batons to prevent them from <laughs> going any further. And the, indeed, the, the burst of brain gun fire that I gave was sufficient to make them move back, uh, abandoning the corpse or the near corpses of the, of the civilians in the courtyard. <laughs> At which point, the same Havildar, I felt, <laughs> on my right was grabbing the Bren gun and I said to myself uh oh we have a mutiny on our hands because he's objecting to my firing at the Pataan but what he in fact was saying is let me have a go and <laughs> so uh, realizing that this was a disciplined force and they were as outraged as I at the massacre that they could see I uh, left them to it and uh, went back to my headquarters and got a, a battalion, one of the few units that was reliable to surround the place and we managed to grab the uh, Patans and put them in jail and we collected a lot of equipment and rifles, Lee Enfields, all sorts of uh, grenades, uh, any number of arms from this operation and indeed it was the the first time that there had been a sort of <laughs> a military response that had worked. Throughout, you were always worried whether the Muslim Pakistani troops you were working with would be loyal. That's exactly. That was our main problem. And indeed, when the, the, the worst moment probably was a fateful Sunday morning, the 7th of September 1947, which I'll always remember, when I was in my own bungalow and I got news that the uh, Punjab battalion and the, the 19th Lancers unit next door were <laughs> firing on each other and had deployed in sort of battle position, I rushed round in my jeep to the brigade commander's house that wasn't all that far away, told him about it, and he... Uh, grabbed his hat he was wearing a white shirt and shorts I remember but he had his brigadier's uh, cap with the sort of red band around it and he said drive straight down the middle and he stood up and yelled to them to cease fire and I kept driving and when we reached the, the middle thank god they, they stopped firing at each other uh, he went towards the lancers and I went towards the Punjabis and uh, his order to me was first thing you do, get them to stand up and stop firing. And uh, miraculously they did. But uh, <laughs> the result was that the this Punjab regiment could of course not be used on any kind of uh, civil unrest uh, uh, operation for the rest of that period. But the battle between Patans and Sikhs which you were seeing in the streets of Peshawar was replicated within the cantonment. It was, yes. It was all over Peshawar, in Peshawar city, in Peshawar cantonment. Uh, yes, it really was. And it was a, a very nasty situation for about 10 days until we managed to get all the Sikhs out, partly by road and partly by air. That's right. Thanks ever so much. Okay.